Amen. Psalm 8. Psalm 8 only has nine verses. And we've looked at this before as we looked at the theme of creation in the Psalms. But we're going to see some of the passages that deal with Jesus Christ. You look at verse 2. It says there, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. And so we see here a a passage of scripture that Jesus alludes to in Matthew chapter 21. If you want to hold your place here and turn to Matthew chapter 21 when Jesus on the last week of his life was entering into Jerusalem. When they were going in and he was riding on a donkey, they were crying out, Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, the multitude went before, and those who followed cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And um, verse 10 says, And when they had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And you look down further, it says, But, verse 15, the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. That means they were angry. And uh, said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. And he's going back to Psalm 8 and verse 2. So the concept of the praise that's coming from these babes and nursing infants, these children that are are worshiping, they're innocent, they're worshiping Christ, they're welcoming Christ, they're open to Christ's teaching, is uh, something that's found there in Psalm 8 and verse 2. And the, the chief priests and the scribes who were against Christ didn't like what was being said, But he says, have you never read? And he quotes from Psalm 8 and verse 2 about the mouth of babes and nursing infants perfecting praise. Now, back to Psalm 8. You see here something that directly uh, has to do with Jesus becoming human. We know Jesus was divine. We know that Psalm 2 we saw... Uh, when we studied it last uh, time, we had a class on the Psalms. In Psalm 2, Jesus is the Son of God. He's referred to as being divine. Uh, but He also became man. He became human without giving up His deity. He took on humanity without giving up His deity. And Psalm 8 is going to talk about that. As David is talking about the creation of man, he says in verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man that you visit Him. You have made Him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned Him with glory and honor. Now this is talking about the creation of man here. As you consider uh, man being a special creation, I mean the whole world was created for man to exist in. That's why this world was created, so that Adam and Eve could exist in it, and we ourselves as their descendants. But it has a special reference to Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. In the book of Hebrews we find chapter 2. The Hebrews writer is going to talk about the humanity of Christ. After in chapter 1 he talked about the deity of Christ. There's a lot of quotes from the Psalms in the Hebrew writing. And in Hebrews chapter 2, it says in verse 5, He has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? This is Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. 
You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your hands and have put all things in subjection under his feet. So he's taking this quotation about the creation of humanity and he's saying it has an application to Jesus. Now let's look at the explanation in, uh, further in verse 8. Hebrews 2 and verse 8. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Talking about humanity in general. There's one enemy that's yet to be destroyed. What's the Bible say that is? Death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the last enemy to be destroyed when Jesus returns and there's the resurrection of all the dead, that last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, Jesus conquered death by his resurrection from the dead. Himself personally, he conquered death. But he's going to conquer death for the whole human race at the end of time. Now, look at verse 9, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels... For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So here is Jesus being made lower than the angels, taking on human nature. John 1 and verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So he came in the nature of being Human, so that he might suffer and die. Philippians chapter 2 talks about that. That he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So there's many other passages that talk about this. Sometimes the word is used uh, to describe it as incarnation. That means in the flesh. God was incarnate among us, in the flesh among us. The virgin birth shows that he was God in the flesh. His miracles proved that he was a God in the flesh, and his resurrection certainly did. So we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. He had to be made in this nature so he could die. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So this passage here in uh, Psalm 8 has a reference to Jesus Christ in and to what he was willing to do. And we're going to see other psalms that talk about that as well. Other psalms that deal with the fact that he was indeed one who uh, was willing to suffer and die. And uh, die as a man who was also God. He had to have that nature in order to die and shed his blood. Any questions or comments before we go any further let's look at psalm 16 psalm 16 psalm 16 is a a psalm of david here And it's a psalm talking about the the hope of the faithful and and also uh, of the Messiah's victory. Look at verses 9 through 11. David says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. The old King James says the grave. It's the Hebrew word sheol. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So here we have something that has to do with someone dying and but they're not left in that condition of death well we come into the new testament we see exactly how this is fulfilled in jesus christ turn to the book of acts acts chapter 2 
the day the church began. Acts chapter 2, Jesus is already back in heaven. He has sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles in a miraculous way called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter and the rest of the apostles are preaching, but we have Peter's sermon recorded for us. And Peter is saying about Jesus, verse 23, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. This just happened a few weeks earlier before this sermon is taking place. You took him with lawless hands, crucified, and you put him to death. Verse 24, whom God raised up. That's the resurrection. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. He conquered death. Up from the grave he arose, we sing. Other Other songs we sing that talk about the victory of Jesus over the grave. As proof of that, he appeals to Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. He says in verse 25, For David says, Acts 2 and verse 25, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Now he explains it in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now that's very important. Because when David wrote this, David was not writing about what was going to happen to himself. And Peter says, here's the proof of it. You can go down and look at his tomb today. He's dead and he's buried, and you can go to his tomb and see his tomb today. So what what David said in that psalm could not have been referring to himself personally. Look at verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, David was a prophet. In other words, he foresaw something revealed to him by God that was going to happen in the future, some thousand years after he was dead. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his right, uh, on his throne he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses now the word sheol in the text there in Psalm 16 is equivalent to the New Testament word Hades. Sheol and Hades are talking about the same thing. It's like the word Messiah is the same as the word Christ. Sheol is sometimes translated the grave, but most of the time it's referring to the realm of the dead. That's where the spirits go when you die. Hades is talking about the same thing. It's just the Greek equivalent to that word. It means the unseen realm. When we die, our spirits leave this realm and our spirits go to Hades. In Hades, there are two places within Hades. You can imagine a circle and it divided in half. One part is torment. The other part is paradise. The righteous, the saved, the innocent, when they die, they go to Hades, but they go to paradise. The wicked, the lost, when they die, they go to Hades, but they go to torment in Hades. Hades is talking about the whole realm. Within that realm, there's those two sections. And that, that place called Hades is like a waiting room. It's a waiting room for the resurrection. 
So when we die, our spirits go to that place. And if we're right with God, we go to paradise. That's why Jesus on the cross said to the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. The spirit goes to paradise when it's right with God. That's a, that's a waiting room. Waiting for the resurrection at the end of time. And uh, the wicked, they go to Hades as well, but they go to torment. Luke chapter 16 talks about that. They're waiting as well for the resurrection. Jesus came forth from that realm. He came forth. His soul was reunited with his body. That's why it says his flesh did not see corruption. His flesh, his body did not undergo decay. He was resurrected. Our bodies, our flesh will when we die, but at the end of time, Jesus will resurrect it. And it will be changed in a marvelous way if we're right with God in a way that's glorified, that is uh, something that is fit for eternity, that is a, a, a body that is in a glorious condition. And that's described in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as much as our minds can understand it. But the point is, they killed Jesus, but Jesus conquered death. That's the point. They killed him, but his soul wasn't left in Hades, nor did his body decompose. He conquered death by his resurrection from the dead. And verse 32 is saying, uh, we saw it. We saw him after he had been resurrected. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. What did Jesus tell them in Acts chapter 1? You will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So they were witnesses of what happened. They saw Jesus after he was resurrected. And therefore, they were bearing witness, bearing testimony to the fact that he has indeed been resurrected from the dead. Not only that, verse 33, he's therefore exalted to the right hand of God. That's his coronation. He's at the right hand of God. He's ruling now. Verse 36, he's both Lord and Christ. That's ruler. He's ruling as Lord of Christ. So the one they took with lawless hands and killed conquered death and now is in heaven as a ruler. But he's a benevolent ruler. He's a loving ruler. He's offering them forgiveness for what they did. For killing him. That's the amazing grace of God. The very ones that were shouting just a few weeks ago, crucify him. He's extending forgiveness to them if they repent and be baptized and follow him for the rest of their days. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ was foreseen in the scriptures. So again, we see that the, the Jews who were very knowledgeable of the Word of God, who were not blinded by the false teachings and the false expectations of what the Messiah should have been, uh, were, would become believers very easily because Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Any questions or comments about what we're looking at? I think uh, Psalm 16 and verse 11 is a, a very beautiful verse, and it talks about why heaven is going to be so wonderful. Psalm 16 and verse 11, You will show me the path of life. Of course, we know it in the New Testament as Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, the life. John 14 and verse 6, No one comes to the Father but through me. In your presence is the fullness of joy, and your right hand are pleasures forevermore that's heaven the fullness of joy is in heaven pleasures forevermore are in heaven you see we whatever pleasure we have down here on earth it's only temporary whatever uh joy we have down here on earth even as a christian is only temporary because it's sometimes interrupted by sadness it's sometimes interrupted by heartache persecution difficulty but in heaven, there's the fullness of joy. What does it say in Revelation uh, uh, 21 and 22? God wipes away all tears. There's no tears in heaven. There, there's no sadness. There's no sorrow. There's, there's nothing but the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. And if we can get people to realize the pleasures of heaven, 
and how that is something that is much greater than any amount of pleasure of sin here upon the earth, then they will take seriously their soul's condition. Because in heaven it never stops. And it's righteous. And it's forevermore. And Jesus made all that possible. Psalm 22. We looked at this in a sermon a few weeks ago. Psalm 22 is, is talking about uh, the, the death of Jesus on the cross. It's talking about how he uh, suffered on the cross uh, and describing his execution really before the, the, the process of um, crucifixion was even uh, invented. So we see here that David, again, writing this, he's writing by the inspiration of God because he's going to talk about how the Messiah would die, his, the, 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 the circumstances surrounding his death, the means by which he died. And there's no way David could have known that naturally. There's no way he could have had any fathom of a concept in his own natural mind how that would happen. This was revealed to him by God. First off, we start by looking at Psalm 22 and verse 1, where David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Isn't that exactly what Jesus said on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And your words of my groanings. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you did not hear. And in the night season, and I and am not silent. I am not silent. So we see here, the, David the psalmist is talk, crying out to God, Why have you forsaken me? But we know that Jesus was actually crying this out in his pain and suffering on the cross look at Matthew chapter 27 and I think it may be recorded in each one of the gospel accounts but Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46 verse 45 and 46 I believe it, it I don't believe it's a coincidence that when he was on the cross when the darkness fell over all the land he cried out like this I think there's a correlation there Verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, that would have been from noon to three, there was darkness over all the land. This was a supernatural darkness. It didn't just get cloudy, it got dark. Verse 46, and about the ninth hour, this would have been about three, by the way, the same time the priest would have been sacrificing in the temple the lambs. I don't think that's a coincidence either. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they thought he was calling for Elijah. Now the concept of Jesus being forsaken is something that we have to to understand to understand the full import of this. One author said this, no man can fathom all that this outcry must have meant in the personal experience of Christ, for no mortal ever suffered as he suffered. No person ever suffered as Christ suffered. Because he was not only suffering physically, he was bearing what? Sins of the world. The sins of the world. All of my sins, all of your sins. I mean, if it was my sins, that would be bad enough. But he had your sins he was bearing. Everything from the, what people think are little innocent white lies to the worst immorality that your mind could ever imagine, he was bearing that. Of every human being that ever did live, was living, and ever will live from his standpoint. From the, for, for the whole human race. 
You know, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. He made Christ to be sin for us. And I believe because the Bible teaches that sin separates from God, us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that Jesus on the cross, when he was bearing all of that, was separated from the Father. And I believe that was a spiritual death that he was undergoing. So he died on the cross, I believe, in two manners. Spiritually, separated from the Father, and then physically, he died. And I believe that darkness over the land was, was indicating that. I believe that was a, a, a visible manifestation of the horror of what was going on. The, 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 the terribleness of what was happening on the cross. And so Jesus was separated from the Father. Isaiah 53 talks about how he would bear the sins. He would be the sin bearer. And so uh, Jesus bearing the sins was separated from the Father. And here you have God the Son on the earth, pure, innocent, who had never sinned, never did anything wrong, bearing all the brunt of the sin of humanity of all the human race. No one ever suffered like him. I mean, that's hard to to get your mind around. Hard for me to get my mind around. So you have uh, Jesus being separated uh, on the cross. Now look down further in Psalm 22. Yes. Okay. Uh, Verse 46 is not... Okay, I didn't know, I didn't look that up, but good, Uh, I'm glad. Yeah, so it's only in Matthew's account. Okay. Well, that would be uh, significant since Matthew was writing from a Jewish standpoint um, as to... uh, It's in Mark's account. Okay, yeah, Matthew and Mark have it. So scratch that previous observation that I was about to make. So, yeah, Matthew and Mark have it. The other accounts don't. So you, you put all the accounts together, you have a full understanding of what went on. Each, each account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are looking at Jesus from a different perspective. And that's why one will mentioned something the other hasn't and so those different perspectives you put them all together you get the fullness of what happened there now back to psalm 22 look at verse uh, 12 now this is talking about the circumstances and the means by which jesus died it says many bulls have surrounded me strong bulls of bashan have encircled me They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shared, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's crucifixion. At this time, when David wrote this, crucifixion had not even been invented yet. It had not been invented. And I believe it uh, may have been the Persians, if I have my history right, that invented it. But it was the Romans who perfected it. And crucifixion was the means by which you tortured someone to death, basically. And someone being crucified could last on the cross for several days, and they would die from various causes. Just a combination of those causes would bring about a person's death. And so the, the way of, of killing someone was you, you crucify them on the cross and let the, let the elements really uh, kill them and blood loss and all the other things. 
So this shows us the, the manner in which Jesus died. How he died on the cross and, and the circumstances around it. Was Jesus on the cross surrounded by enemies? Yes. Back to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, when they crucified him. Verse 38. Matthew 27 and verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, the one on his right, another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So that's fulfilling what you find there in Psalm 22. Bulls have surrounded me. They gape at me with their mouths. They're speaking all these words against me. So they're taunting him while he's suffering on the cross. Likewise, verse 41 in Matthew chapter 27, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now, we know one of them had a change of heart. Luke records that. But at first, he was getting it from all sides, have encircled me. His enemies had encircled him. Not only ones that were executing him, giving him a hard time while he's on the cross, the two who were being executed with him were speaking against him until one of them had a change of heart. Remember, he, he was on the cross for six hours. It wasn't just... A 20-minute ordeal. It was six hours that he was on the cross. So a lot of time passed. And so uh, that one thief had a change of heart concerning uh, what was about to take place with him dying. And so you see the circumstances around uh, his death. Those who were speaking against him were there. And look at verse 18. Well, look at verse 17 of uh, uh, Psalm 22. I can count all of my bones. They look and they stare at me. They're seeing him on the cross. They're looking, they're staring. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse 35. Then they crucified him. And divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. So here you have the fulfillment of what they did with his clothing. Now, when these these soldiers were doing this, they had no clue that they were fulfilling Scripture. They didn't know they were fulfilling the Word. And so it was something that uh, they would just, they would do, you know. This looks something, like something valuable. We're, we're going to cast lots for it. That was just their normal behavior, what they would do uh, with a criminal. And, of course, we know Christ wasn't really a criminal. But in their minds, he was just an ordinary criminal. And so you see the fulfillment of that detail there. And so you have... Uh, the concept of Jesus dying, the manner in which he died, his crucifixion, the circumstances around his death there in Psalm 22, and the fact that he was separated from God as a result of that um, being on the cross and bearing uh, our sins in his own body. So as we read this, this helps me grow an appreciation for what Jesus did and the scheme of redemption that God um, <coughs> put in place and the fact that he could use men's cruelty to bring about salvation that's that's genius that's brilliance he used man's rebellion and cruelty and wickedness and said i'm going to use that to bring about man's salvation i mean that is just amazing to me that emphasizes the amazing grace of god probably more than anything now 
Let's look at Psalm 23. This is probably the most well-known Psalms in the whole Bible. Probably next to John 3 and verse 16, it is probably the most well-known passage in the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. And oftentimes people don't think of it in the terms of, of a messianic psalm or a psalm pertaining to the Messiah. But when you look at, at, look at it from the, the standpoint of what Jesus was and what Jesus claimed to be and is, the great shepherd of the sheep, then it does have its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this concept here of David writing, and David writing about his relationship to God as the Lord, and that's that Hebrew name Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, Yahweh, is my shepherd. Now, sometimes this psalm is read, and sometimes it's read at funerals and read in, 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 in connection with people who never followed Jesus, who never followed God. And they read it as though it applies to this individual in the casket or the, someone they're trying to memorialize. That doesn't apply. Many people get a false comfort from this passage. This is referring to someone who believes in God and follows Him, does His will. It's not just something to read at a funeral. This is referring to a relationship a person has with God. God will provide for us everything that we need. And you think about Jesus uh, being the great provider for us and how he will lead us and bless us and he restores our soul there in verse 3. Did Jesus die to bring about restoration? He died to bring us back, to restore us back to God. The, the poetry there depicting uh, the, sh the uh, sheep being blessed with green pastures and led by still waters, being taken care of. That talks about all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His namesake. We are Christians, followers of Christ. And when we follow His will, we're, we're following Him in the paths of righteousness, doing what's right. Every time we follow Jesus in every situation, public or private, it's right. It's right. Therefore, it's righteousness. Verse 4 talks about walking through the um, valley of the shadow of death. That's the hardships that we face in this life. Uh, it says, I will fear no evil for you. You are with me. What did Jesus said? Lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Or into the world. Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 20, I believe is the verse. So we have Jesus being with us even through the difficult times. I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The staff and the rod were used by the shepherd to protect the sheep. And sometimes those shepherd staffs were hooked so they could help the sheep, you know, get out of uh, difficult situations. And the rod was used for disciplinary purposes. So God's word uh, is something that helps us, guides us, shows us what's right. That's his staff and rod in this uh, poetry. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Even in the midst of my enemies, I am blessed to have a table. I'm blessed to have provisions given to me. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Anointing one's head with oil was something uh, that was uh, a blessing, indicating a blessing and indicating uh, someone is special. 
That's what you did with prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament. You anointed them into that office. We are special to God. He anoints our head with oil. That's an honored guest. That's an honor to follow Jesus Christ. My cup runs over. That's talking about the blessings that just keep pouring. It just keeps pouring out all the blessings that God has for us. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. We're going to leave behind goodness and mercy as we live and follow the great shepherd. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Of course, that has reference to heaven eventually. Now look at John chapter 10. We don't have a whole lot of time. And next week, Lord willing, we'll touch on this a little bit deeper. But John chapter 10, Jesus takes this concept, which is found here in other places, about being the good shepherd and applies it to himself. And uh, the, his people being uh, the sheep. Look at verse 14. Or look at verse 11. Go back to verse 11. John 10 and verse 11. Well, we'll go back to verse 10. Sorry. John 10 and verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they might have it more abundantly. My cup runs over. More abundantly. That means overflowing life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. There's his death that restores us. We're restored by the good shepherd. A hireling, he who is not the shepherd... One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and will leave the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. This is the third time he said it. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. I have a relationship with them. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. There's his crucifixion. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I will bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Those other sheep, talking about the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish, people like us, we're Gentiles. We can be a part of the sheepfold, part of the flock. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about those who are afar off are brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. One body, both Jew and Gentile, made up of all races. And there will be only one flock. That's the church. There's only one church. Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church. There's only one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And one shepherd, one ultimate leader over the church he's not at the vatican he is in heaven the one shepherd of the sheep now there's many more things to say about that a little bit later on in chapter 10 but this is the relationship that we have because jesus ultimately fulfills the concept that's found there in psalm 23 he is the lord that is our shepherd blesses us, restores our soul. And if we follow Him, He will bless us. Even when we go through the hard times, He will bless us. And if we are faithful to Him, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where there's pleasures forevermore. That's heaven. But you see, we've got to follow. That's obedience. That's obedient faith. We will uh, take up our study next week as we uh, study more uh, concerning uh, Jesus in the Psalms.